What's the puzzle here? Ew, I don't like that. Not how it sounds. Apparently, I lost. I should be crucified. Hey, fellas. Leo's here. And don't mind me. I just lost my keys and I'm late for work. Oh, I'm so excited. I'm gonna finally beat the boss. Video games were funny, you only needed to cause a little bit of genocide and you were the town's hero. No need to make it complicated, kids were just looking for a good time, bright colors and frantic gameplay. You wouldn't pay to sit and think about what you did. On purpose. Gaming is a way to keep your mind away from things like homework, teachers, you know, hard thinking. You don't wanna feel the pressure of solving quizzes, you just wanna murder Bowser. Or this guy, Ganon, what? The video game puzzle, famously brought to the mainstream by The Legend of Zelda, but the true first iteration of Migraine came from Flag Capture on the Atari 2600, which was basically the predecessor to what we know as Minesweeper. You move around the grid where you have to find a hidden flag, along the way you find clues like directions, how many steps you are from the goal, and bombs. So yeah, Minesweeper with extra steps. But a really big innovation came with Sokoban for the PC-8801 in 1982 where you had to move boxes around the room, making sure that they didn't get stuck or you had to start from scratch. I used to love this type of games as a kid. I didn't get far, but just managing to figure out one of these rooms for what felt like an hour of trying was just satisfying. And it only got better from there. Another good invention came from Konami the same year, Locomotion, an arcade game where you had to move the tracks to keep the train moving all the way to the end. If you ever played one of those pipe dream games, well, this is where they came from. And other games had their own version of the puzzle, even some by Konami themselves. But nothing could compare to the juggernaut that will be released to the masses, taking the world by storm! It all makes sense now. The creator, Alexis Pajetnov, said that he got inspired by the real game Pentomino, where players need to arrange falling blocks without producing any gaps. So he wasn't inspired, he just straight up copied it. This thing went huge worldwide, selling over 30 million units on the Game Boy alone, and being ported to just about everything. It remains pretty much unchanged to this day, only adding a few gimmicks here and there, which is good because you don't want to do something unnecessary like, oh I don't know, turning it 3D. <laughs> but it was in 1986 when Nintendo would bring to life one of its flagship franchises, The Legend of Zelda. The game to bring puzzles and action together and become one of the most beloved games of that generation. Well, 2 out of 3 ain't bad. The first game wasn't really a puzzle game, it was an adventure game and the things that made us think those were just cryptic stuff. It was about trying to move every rock, kill every enemy, burn every bush! The, but why though? Even though the second game was mostly action and exploring the dungeons, it wasn't until the third game, A Link to the Past, that puzzles started to become common ground and expanded upon with every subsequent game, getting more and more complex with every entry. Why this? And even though Zelda is the poster child for adventure puzzle games, there was another genre altogether that was all about puzzles from the start. Not my thing. The point and click games. Based on text based adventures, were brought to the mainframe by Sierra in 1983 with the creation of King's Quest Quest for the Crown. Man, that's slow. But that was the whole point of these games to take your time, look around, and try using everything with everything. The so called point and click sin. Their genre was played with these moments where the player would be stuck and needed to talk to every single NPC, try to offer them every item at your disposal, and if you have multiple options, you can kiss your afternoon goodbye because this trip to London has no stops. Thankfully, with the sequels and other succeeding franchises, the gameplay was improved, including the usage of the mouse and making the overall interactions less convoluted. But those pesky little consoles just had to try their hands on the matter, and what we got was some of the most backward ass, complicated, and just messed up puzzles in existence. If you're not Lucasfilm, one of the greatest overlooked classics for the NES, Maniac Mansion puts you in the boots of multiple playable characters that you can cycle between to entangle the mystery of the mansion itself, with all the action shown at the top and the options at the bottom, with the tone of the game being about humor in a B-horror setting. It's great that they didn't take the whole setting seriously and just made it as fun as possible. There's a reason why people find this game enthralling to this day. Again, I haven't personally beat it, but man, it's so fun seeing the reaction of the characters, what crazy sh** can happen in this place, and also you can blow up a hamster for some reason. They created a genre of killing rodents. LucasArts went on to become one of the most profitable game developers from the 80s and 90s, mostly focusing on these point and click games, one of the most celebrated being the Monkey Island games, where you have to use a rubber chicken with a poly in the middle. I will never forgive you for this. Now, like I said before, the point and click game genre isn't one of my favorites, but I do respect what it added to video games as a whole. 
I mean, even with all the cryptic stuff here and there, you have to admit, they basically created dialogue trees that games use nowadays, and they have actually been two games all the way through. The first one was... During the day! The first clock tower for the Super Famicom. As you can imagine, being a horror game was never released outside of Japan. Oh, I wonder why. At first I felt frustrated because I couldn't really control the character, only where to go and what to interact with, which is the basis for these games, but dude, after sh** went down, I had to get the girl to safety, man, this crazy asshole was gonna cut her! It was funny, the game had multiple endings depending on who you save throughout the story, but you could bail out and leave everyone behind, but then you got bodied by the scissor guy. It's a really fun experience, but if you're not really that into point and click games, I got bad news for you. Pac-Man 2 The New Adventures I just wanna meet the guy who saw this and said Yeah, you know what? Depression! And then proceeded to make this I don't know man, this is regarded as one of the most whatever I don't care why even bother games ever But I kinda like it Yes, the guy that's not that into point and click games just happens to like the game Everyone disregards Oh, I think I might make you notice it's just weirdly entertaining for me. Not so much about making Pac-Man regret ever being born like some people do, but just helping the guy to have a good life and not feel dead for once. <laughs> the game is just funny and beating up random people with rocks is just cathartic. Wonder who that witch is though, oh never mind. It's done I guess. So yeah, that's about as far as my experience goes with the genre. I should be crucified. Even though point and click games went through a drought during the 2000s and part of the 2010s, they went through a resurgence thanks to retro inspired games made by developers that understood and loved what Sierra and LucasArts games were at their core. Fun adventures with crazy dialogues and mind bending puzzles. Now, when you think about puzzles as secondary functions, what genre usually comes to mind? RPGs, right? Well, when you think about it, the first few games coming out for the NES didn't really include them outside of talking to an NPC to trigger the next part of the game or giving them a certain item. But that ain't a puzzle, that's just extending gameplay and not knowing how to seamlessly connect the two parts of the story. And when you think about it, one of the biggest franchises in the history of RPGs doesn't really have puzzles. The Final Fantasy games. Yeah, they have minigames, hunts, races, boss gauntlets and world traversal, but barely any puzzles. There are more real jigsaw puzzles than actual puzzles in this franchise, what the hell? I think the only case was the 15th puzzle in the original Final Fantasy that you have to use a code to access once you obtain the airship. And no, the card games don't count, that's an entirely different genre. But I guess they just focused on the battles and story and didn't give any thought to adding any extra flair to the game outside of kill this many enemies to get a prize. Ah, sweet gun! But I have to say, if you love RPGs and love puzzles a la Zelda, then I just got your feeling right here. Luffy 2 Rise of the Sinistrals, a game developed by Neverland and published by Natsume in 1996 and Taito in 1995 in Japan. It serves as a prequel to Luffy and the Fortress of Doom, but who the hell cares because we have a good game here! This is one fantastic piece of gold, man. I'm sad that it's not mentioned as much as the big titles in the system because the gameplay is fast but also strategic, the characters are lovable, the story, although simplistic, is cool, and you have the Cave of the Ancients which is basically its own game within this game with a hundred randomly generated floors that you start with nothing and must reach the bottom. And I've only done it once and apparently I lost. Right, I double. This game is amazing, but the best part, no doubt, are the puzzles. There's a large variety of puzzles and items to use, like the arrow, the bomb, the chain, the sand clock to reset the room if you get stuck, and more. But the craziest ones sometimes don't even need items. Dude, when I was in high school, a friend and I would always talk about the game, mostly that I would get married and me being <coughs> gross. Stay strong, virgin. But also the difficult puzzles that you find throughout the different dungeons. Sure, there's not that much variety like caves, dungeons, towers, and the like, but no joke, I spent an entire week trapped in this one dungeon because I couldn't get past these two color coded puzzles. And I had to wait till the next day to talk to my friend so he could explain how the hell was I supposed to make all the blocks yellow. And I did it, damn it. Then the next room had more blocks. F there are so many memories that I have with this game, dude. Sure, I can basically beat it all the way through no problem, but there is one puzzle that to this day I still need a guide because it was so asinine. And to even reach it you had to complete another puzzle. 
Ew, I don't like that. Not how it sounds. Dubbed the world's most difficult trick, it's located close to the end of the game. And thankfully it's optional because the amount of steps that you had to take in order to beat this thing, it's over a hundred. I still remember people saying that they call hotlines to ask how to beat this thing. Listen man, I not been paid enough. But overall, this case is an incredible blend of action adventure, RPG and puzzles, and really difficult at that. And everyone should try it if you're somewhat interested in any of these genres. Speaking of which... I've already talked about the Golden Sun games, but I wish to concentrate on the puzzle aspect of the series. Man, one thing that I love is that not only are there puzzles in just about every room in the game, but also that they don't involve the try and true, kill every enemy, keep going. You actually have to form a path, find the perfect spot, and the game just guides you through the whole game without actually you noticing. Like for example, after you get the spell revealed, you know that using it in spots where cycling blocks on the ground will show you something. And hell, there's this puzzle that you have to touch the rocks according to the color on the wall, but only now I learned that you can use reveal to find the color on the rocks and not need to guess. And again, the game doesn't tell you that. 20 years, Jesus Christ. And also how you arrange your gins can help you solve puzzles, by allowing you to use certain side energy that you couldn't otherwise. Like fire and earth can help you grow plants, that's ironic. And I had to be honest, at the beginning of the second game, I was stuck in this part for the longest time because I didn't know you could just jump over. When I finally got it, I thought I had a brain tumor. So yeah, personally when I think of puzzles, my mind instantly goes to RPGs, and I wish newer games included them, but sadly they are mostly relegated to smaller indie games that thankfully keep the genre alive. But again, it would be fantastic if game developers went back to their roots every once in a while and added stuff to spice up the gameplay. Speaking of indie... I love this. Super Meat Boy, the brainchild of Edmund McMillan and Tommy Ruffiness. Seasons controlling the teacher character going through multiple levels trying to save his girlfriend, bandaged girl from the evil grasp of Dr. Fetus. Thank the lord it was made in 2010. Now, what I love about the game is not only its fair difficulty and fast pace, but also that it's a puzzle platformer. But not like Super Ghosts and Ghosts where you have to slowly, and I mean slowly, move around and see what your enemies do before you can react. Here you have to move fast, avoid traps, guns, sauce, salt and everything else. Dude, the world's a toaster. But the game doesn't just throw you to the walls all willy nilly. You start with tutorial like stages, showing you how to run, jump and wall jump. And then they slowly start adding things to make it more and more difficult. To the point where I start to wonder if it's all worth it. Just by dying over and over, you start to understand how to properly move about, avoid enemies, reach the end, see your girlfriend being beat up accordingly, and then see your attempts playing at the same time. I gotta say, it's one of my favorite parts seeing how after so many attempts, you manage to overcome that freaking mount of a stage. Out of like 300. But, what if you're not into spending 2 hours in a single stage? Well, how about... Well, maybe one. Shovel Knight! Released in 2014 by Jack Clock Games, the game came to... Well, everywhere, and it's a platformer inspired by Mega Man and Zelda 2. This one, jeez, I can't lie, this is one of my favorite games ever, and with no exaggeration, if you play it, you know why. It blends platforming elements with action, making it seem like Mega Man or Contra, but without much shooting. I mean, you can, but you're kinda limited, but you don't really need it because your shovel is so damn powerful as it is. And the abilities that you acquire just make you basically invincible if you use them well enough. You can upgrade your skills and armor, play optional stages, beat characters in this overworld inspired by Mario 3. Man, this game is just great! And don't sleep on the stages, some have puzzle elements in them. I personally love the fire stage in particular, where you have to use this green goo to give the lava the properties of rubber and go! Well, there you go, game's perfect! But moving along the stage, the way to get the goo on the lava becomes trickier, and also there's this giant beetle that you must jump on to find the best way across. It's not a puzzle in the traditional way, but if you cannot move accordingly, well it's super meat boy for you. And it hurts even more because you lose money every time you die, and you can try and get it back, but if you die before getting it, you lose the earlier money plus the amount from this time. Hmm, kinda like that other game. Oh yeah, Hollow Knight. Huh, who could it be this time of day? It's only... Jesus, I haven't breakfast yet! Alright, who is it? Hello, it's me, your friend, Ami Dala! Oh, isn't that a girl's name? Ah, it is! Just like Celeste! Oh yeah, that one in the game! But wait, that's not the name of... 
socialize as a platformer development 2018 by extremely okay games more like extremely good <laughs> this is a game where you play as not celeste who has to climb up yes celeste to defeat her worst enemy depression i ain't going no man along the way she has to jump and dash through multiple rooms each with their own puzzles and every stage adds new mechanics like the green gems that allow you to dash one more time in the air dream blocks that she can dash through and moving blocks that allow her to maintain momentum mid jump there are also these optional strawberries that you can collect by beating this incredibly hard puzzle there it is where you have to reach the strawberry and then safely reach the ground so they can be added to the inventory this counts to the end game where they indicate what kind of cake and therefore what ending you get the more the merrier of course even at one point in the game you get an additional dash which you would think would make things easier right this game is marvelous dude now to conclude let's briefly go over another genre i barely played the strategy games now this can be divided in subgenres themselves going from real time to turn based the only turn based i've ever been is final fantasy tactics advanced and real time is age of empires so my credentials are going down the drain too you might think what's the puzzle here i don't see any jigsaw puzzles but ah that's where you're wrong the main trick here is knowing what units to use send them in the correct direction and what actions to take if you think about it, the whole battle is a puzzle in itself. And sure, for strategy RPGs, you can just grind to make battles easier, but what about the boss battles? Ah, now you need to know which units are best to keep everyone alive, but also deal damage and take abuse. Or maybe finish the fight as fast as possible. There's a bunch of variables to keep in mind, and that's the whole beauty of these games. But when I watch a great battle where every part falls in place, it's so satisfying. Like a jigsaw. Portal is good, yes. Puzzles will always be a part of video games, in somewhere or another, and I'm happy that the developers keep the flame alive to this day. Even in Indoso, you wouldn't expect to have puzzle elements like Mario Maker, GTA Online, and Snoopy of all things. Nah, screw that. <laughs>